Hello, welcome to the second of the three interviews with businessman, lawyer, ex-politician, one-time lobbyist and passionate Western Australian, Julian Grill. Julian, last inter interview we concluded with a short discussion of the Triple C investigation, which amongst other things greatly impacted on your life and those of many other people. Many people might be interested to know exactly why you've not just let go of the Triple C investigation and not moved on. Why are you, you continuing to pursue this matter? In a few words, because I don't want to see it happen again. I don't want to see people hurt in the way they were hurt in that set of inquiries by the Triple C. Are you saying in that that you don't think Western Australia should have a Triple C? Australia generally and Western Australia should have a Triple C. I've always argued in favour of a Triple C, but I think it should have a defined role and it should act in accordance with the law and it shouldn't become an East German Stasi-like organisation. So are you angry with the Triple C? No, John, I'm, I'm not angry, uh, but I'm not happy. Yeah. Um, anger and not being happy are different things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do believe that uh, corruption is a scourge. Uh, Australia is relatively free of corruption, uh, but I've seen corruption, rampant corruption in other countries, and uh, it destroys economies, it destroys lives, and it is, destroys uh, people's standard of living. So uh, I think it's a good thing to have a triple C. Uh, it's just got to act within the law. Could you give us some insights into where you think the triple C went wrong? Yes, I can. Um, Firstly, I think that the Triple C were devastatingly wrong in the way they went about public hearings. And uh, ultimately, the Government Oversight Committee agrees with that proposition I just put forward. Just to give you an example, when police have suspicions about the way people are operating, that they may have committed a crime, they investigate it, but they investigate it in confidence and bearing in mind the laws of defamation. In the instances that I'm talking about, the Triple C did not do that. They investigated these matters in the full glare of, of the public and the media. And in the process, they destroyed a whole lot of lives and a whole lot of careers. It was quite devastating. It should never have happened. They, they should have gone about it in a, in a very, very different way indeed. And is there an element of trial by media in all of that? Absolutely. And yes. you think that happened here in Western Australia? Well, I, I think the second factor which is important is that these public trials uh, were conducted in extraordinary circumstances. Firstly, the witnesses that came didn't know that they were accused. They didn't know what they were being accused of they were not able to be represented. They were not able to give evidence in their own right. They were not able to cross-examine witnesses. They had none of the procedural fairnesses that you would get in court, and they couldn't appeal from any of the opinions that were later found. That shouldn't happen in a modern country. I understand that they also couldn't talk about it with people other than their legal counsel outside of outside well, the hearings. That's true. Where there were confidential, where, where there are in-camera hearings, they weren't allowed to speak outside of those. You couldn't even speak to your wife, for instance. I understand. When, when I went down, for instance, to the in-camera hearings, I couldn't even tell my wife where I was going or where I had been. Uh, so it was a pretty bizarre process and it was very, very unfair. There would have been at least 100 people badly hurt by this process. But if they'd got a higher level of conviction out of it, that might have been a different thing. But I recall in the first interview you noted that there were, there were 48 charges laid, but only one found to be, to be of merit. About, about 40, uh, as I last counted. Uh, there was um, only one conviction where... Uh, there was only one case where a conviction was recorded. And that wasn't against you? No, it was against somebody else. Yes. But it was a minor matter and they were fined and that was the end of it. So, so how can we get to a situation where there are 40-odd charges applied and one conviction for one of the more minor of those charges? Well, 
Convictions are one thing, but findings are another. And uh, in, um, in the process of these public hearings, people were absolutely defamed uh, with uh, specious allegations made against them. And one of the criticisms I have of the Triple C is that when these suspicions were found to be fallacious, they were never corrected. Mm. Uh, and they should have been corrected. But they just lie there on the public record, they're still there today, and people can go back and have a look at them. What they should have done in their reports was to, to have said, we investigated that matter, we found that it wasn't justified, and we withdraw it. They didn't do that. And then, on top of that, uh, they used the deep pockets of government and huge amounts of legal expertise, which they could afford to pay for, to pursue certain people for up to eight years. Mm. And uh, without any success to speak of. Mm. Uh, was it ever corrected? It hasn't been. And that's why I'm writing the book. I was talking to another person affected by the Triple C. It said that during the course of the, of the investigations, old friends would actually cross the road when he walked down the street. Did you find any of that kind of thing? People wanted to stay away or directly affected your relationships with people? Oh, yes. That was immensely the case. Our close friends remained our close friends sure. and there wasn't uh, that sort of sending to Coventry. But in respect to the general population, it was, uh, it was exactly that. So it's taken its toll? Oh, it's takes a huge toll, yes, especially on my wife and my children. Uh, it, it affected them dramatically. I mean, they're, they're not, they don't have a thick, thick hide like me. Uh, they're, they're not set up to bear these sort of crosses. Uh, they find it very, very hard indeed. And indeed, they've been accused of nothing either. That's right. But uh, it's also the innocent public servants, and there were quite a few of those that were publicly accused of doing wrong. In the end, it turned out they hadn't done any wrong at all. Their wives, their children, uh, all of those. Uh, I have um, a close colleague, for instance, um, uh, if you want an example, uh, Norm Marlborough. Yeah. Um, when you actually analyse it, when you actually drill down forensically and have a look at what Norm Marlborough was supposed to have done, he didn't do anything wrong. But he was accused of all sorts of things. He was accused on one occasion, publicly, of taking a $5,000 bribe. Mm. It turned out to be absolutely untrue. Never corrected, still there on the public record, never withdrawn. What happened to Norm? He resigned from Parliament, he resigned his ministry, he went into a psychiatric ward, he nearly committed suicide. Mm. Now, that might have been an extreme example, but others went, went and, close to that. And there were at least three or four public servants who had no direct involvement that were destroyed by this too, weren't there? There were more than three or four. Yeah. There were quite a few. Uh, their names don't crop up and I don't want to mention them because I don't want to cause them any more hurt, but there would have been about 20. And how did your family respond to the knowledge that, they, that there'd been a lot of surveillance during this time? Well, my wife was shell-shocked. Yeah. Uh, and she is still you know, feeling the reverberations from that shock right now. Um, she couldn't believe that people would have come into our home, uh, burgled their way in, uh, put in listening devices, and then listened to her every word to me and her every word to her children. That just appalls her. I can understand that. And recovery. Will you recover from this? Oh, I've recovered. <laughs> I'm pretty tough, but uh, it's hard for other people that are less resilient. Uh, you know, I'm an old warrior. I've trained myself to be tough, but uh, most people don't. And of course they're sensitive and they'll bear those scars forever. Mm. And in closing this second interview, can I just ask you what you personally learned from the Triple C investigations? Well, I no longer have a business with Brian, yeah. but I think that the, thing, the main things I learned were that uh, perception is as strong as the reality. I should have taken more account of that and I should have done more to protect my wife and children. Thank you, Julie.
Thank you, John.